It's been nearly one year since Jonathan J.W. Anderson took on an investment from luxury goods group LVMH. Today, as he unveils a new e-commerce website, names a new CEO, and opens a new headquarters, the business of fashion has the first exclusive look into the J.W. Anderson business strategy, his plans for moving forward, and his new office in East London, a stone's throw from where his fashion journey first began. Thank you, Jonathan, for sitting down with me today. We first met, I don't know if you remember, about five years ago. A long time ago, yeah. At the Fashion East tutorial session. Yeah. This morning, I was just thinking back to that first interaction. Yeah. And how much has happened since then and how much has changed. And I just wondered whether you could talk us through a little bit how, how, you know, how things have changed over that period and how you're feeling now. Yeah. It's it's quite a it's a weird um, it's weird because it it happened in a kind of um, I think in in press I think it it seems like it was overnight um, but it has been a kind of a, a hard graft in terms of where we were five to being in this building right now because we we did start off with menswear and obviously building a business in a menswear capacity is very difficult right. because um, the market level is a lot smaller and uh, contemporary menswear is a lot, it's kind of a very niche market. And and I think when when I met you, I, w I was just about to start into women's and um, we started off with a lookbook and, and as fashion does, you end up kind of addicted to a cycle. You know, you end up then doing women's, and then you and when we first did the first show, which was um, at Somerset House, it I remember where we had no electricity, and it was da da da, and in, and to be here is kind of it's odd sometimes. You kind of have to pinch yourself a bit, but I like that. It was like you know, yesterday it was really nice to be able to put a logo on a piece of glass and kind of be like, well, now we have a building that kind of. It encompasses my world and my environment in one thing and you know it's been tough and we have struggled through it but you know we're here mm -hmm. at the moment and we're not going to be we're, we're not there but we'll we'll get there over the next five ten years do you think that you know that decision to to kind of add the women's wear element into your business and this kind of gender-bending menswear element mm. that's really become a part a big part of the way at least the industry sees you it may not be yeah. how you define yourself but was that a turning point for you to, to to kind of launch into women's wear and then create this kind of fusion in a way i think when we when i did it it was literally translating men's into women's it, we never had the money to repattern it, it literally was men's wear for women um, and I think it was an interesting moment in the industry because I think um, I think this idea of um, menswear in women's had become not a trend but had become a an embraced moment in in fashion. I think Phoebe was a very big influence on that, and I think the idea of um, a wardrobe started to become apparent instead of cocktail dressing. It was more about a holistic wardrobe. I think a big turning point um, with that was when we did the autumn winter collection, which had, you know, very kind of a, um, when I look back on it, it was quite an aggressive point of view, but when I was doing it, it felt completely normal. And it was a kind of, it was a ruffled kind of collection. It was mm -hmm. a lot of military felts and ticking menswear dichotomies and kind of superimposing it with lying. And, and I think it kind of changed people's viewpoint of us because I think it challenged something in people. And I think from that moment, the men's and the women's kind of like became a talking point between each other. Yeah, it's, it's really interesting. I, you know, I teach this course at St. Martin's mm. <clears throat> and every year 
um, one of the projects that the students do for me is they do referencing of other brands in the marketplace. Yes. And the, the really curious thing is every year people are talking about Rei Kawakubo and mm. you know, Yoji and others. And this year in particular, your name came up a lot. And so this influenced this, I mean, if you looked at the St. Martin's show from the other night even, yeah. Um, Willie Walters was explaining to us that a lot of a lot of people have chosen to do menswear, and they've taken this kind of really kind of fused approach that you know you've kind of pioneered. So I think it's become quite influential. Well, I think since um, becoming part of LVMH, um, the advice and the support system, it when it, it, it kind of is weird because when you look back, it sort of it's only been eight, six, seven months. So in the beginning, it was very about, you know, working with the teams there to kind of create a very tight foundation. Um, I've always been commercially minded um, in terms of things. I think, for example, when doing a collaboration with Topshop, um, it was one of their most successful. And I just felt that, you know, with, with fashion, you have to create cult. Um, in your generational peer group. So when I was at university, RAF was the peer group, or Dioram was the peer group. So that was the influence when I went out. So it's about kind of, I feel that it's, we, we live in a, in, a, in a decade where it's, it's nearly fashionable to like fashion. You know, it's sort of, it's the kind of the norm to kind of be involved and to engage. Speaking of the kind of, positioning of the brand. Yeah. Um, part of the strategy going forward, as I understand it, is um, to position the brand as an advanced contemporary yeah. brand. Can you talk a little bit about kind of how that decision came about and why you feel like that's the right approach? Well, it would, I actually started about um, two years ago um, when I was, I was talking to Sachs, and I think it was, um, at that point it was Joe, Batano, and he, we were kind of working out ways in which we would tackle the American market and where we kind of sat. And I think it was at a point where um, there was contemporary and there was the fashion kind of room. And I think because of like shift in economy and shift in, in many kind of different demographics of consumer and what younger consumers were doing was they wanted a fashion element at a price point which was in a mid zone, but they wanted it presented among fashion. They wanted it a, a, like, with luxury big brands. And I think it kind of, you know, you have people like Stella, you have Sakai and in Calm and things kind of fitted into this section that kind of was, is actually the, for me, is the new type of modern luxury. and does luxury exist anymore was the kind of question that I was having. Um, and, and through that, we kind of saw us, we saw that we had better results on floors that were surrounded by perceived luxury brands than contemporary brands. And it was, I think it's the, nearly in a weird way, the entry point into, mm -hmm. say, a luxury sector because it's, um, it's more artisanal in terms of the, it is smaller runs. I think people, the consumer is extremely wise and they want things that are not over distributed. Mm -hmm. um, so it kind of came about really through that. And we saw that the sales were, were doubling when being put in, in those areas. Whereas in the contemporary, we were nearly too high um, in terms of uh, price pointing. And, you know, we want to keep it in the UK or in, in countries like, for example, like Italy that are going to make our bags and leather goods to the level that we want them. Um, so we had to kind of adjust our kind of like um, pricing strategy in terms of product, it, you know, so that you can engage the contemporary and have the elevated pro um, product for kind of the luxury end. Tell me what's happened in the past year. Yeah. Since the LVMH investment, you've moved into this new building, you've hired a bunch of people, you know, what's, what's going on exactly now? Well, I, I, it kind of, if we span back, I think it's seven or eight months, um, 
What was interesting when I sat down with, um, with Delphine and Pierre-Yves was they were, what was interesting was they helped to kind of give me the tools and the resources to be able to articulate better in a, in a business acumen. They weren't going to just hold my hand and do it. It was, we want to keep the entrepreneurial side of it and go and do, go and do what you feel that needs to be done, which in a weird way has been kind of, it was daunting in the beginning because you kind of were like, how do I manage these people? And then what you realize is you have to hire people to manage the people and you kind of learn through your mistakes. And what has happened is we have seen um, an increase in, which I think is to come in the wave. I think we were, we were doubling season on season before, um, but it was managing that expectation wow. from stores. Um, what is very exciting now is that by hiring the right team, a women's wear director, a CEO, a, a merchandiser, and taking advice from LVMH and different parts of LVMH, we were able then to be able to create now the collection that is a balanced collection. You know, there is a balance to it. We have restructuralized the menswear. It's not going to lose its impact, but it has the backup. It's made better. It's got a garment technologist. Things that you would, for, for me before, when, you're, when your business is growing so fast, things fall away at the, the wayside. It's a very good moment in my career. I've, I'm 29, I, I have the energy to do it, and, and I enjoy it. So I think there's, an, a, there's a kind of um, a nice dialogue which I was not, in, was not thinking because ultimately the business side of it comes naturally now, whereas before it was, but how, but you know, and now it's kind of, we link it in. So we have like merchandisers and designers working together, which kind of keeps the movement going. You mentioned the CEO, which yes. is a big step, right? And you know, up until, I remember having conversations with you in the past about trying to manage everything. Yeah. Tell me about the decision to bring someone on to work with you and how you kind of foresee that relationship yeah. working. I, it, it was kind of, we had it in this, when I sat down with Pierre we had worked out a business plan, um, a five-year business plan. And uh, we had put the CEO in, in two, three years and, you know, we wanted to evolve to get to that. But, when we had brought in senior designers and senior accounts and a new sale, we, we had removed sales from, from an agency to back in-house. Um, I felt that, you know, if I'm going to take this brand further, I am going to need a partner in crime. When I wanted, you know, I wanted someone who, um, who had a sales background and someone who could, uh, you know, understand the needs of a small business and a younger team because that's where we were at and um, we we interviewed Simon and um, how did you know he was the right guy um, I met him in Paris um, uh, I think three four months it was, uh, maybe actually it was before Christmas actually and um, I've, I found the, you know, when you're not used to interviewing or hiring or firing ever in your life in terms of that your team just organically grew with you. When you go out to interview people, it's a very odd experience, you know, it's a, because I, I don't, I've always just kind of worked on instinct. I think for me, with, with um, Simon, what was important was I, liked the energy level, the idea of that it can be done. Because I think it was a moment just at Christmas where I was like kind of, was quite overwhelmed and I was like, how do we, how do we get through this five year with someone that you don't know? And I naturally, I just felt I, I could, I, there was the way in which she was speaking, I felt like I could trust and look up to. Right. And I thought I could learn from. And, and I think that's always what I do in, in terms of interviewing people. I feel 
that if I can't learn from them, then there is no point because then you, they end up being a processor. And when you're working at this level and you're doing the amount of collections you need and the business is growing and growing, you need someone that is going to create a dialogue with you and who you are learning from and takes up the other part of your brain. We had interviewed many people and it was the, the only person that I was like, I came out of the meeting and I was like, this is the one. It, felt right. it just felt right. Yeah. And, and then I kind of said, well, I'm not going to say who I like. And then if we both match up and we both pick the same person, then it's meant to be. And I think you kind of have to do it like that because it is about personalities. And I didn't really care if it was a, a Harvard degree or had done this or had worked in a, a mega brand or that. I wanted someone who ultimately was going to be a grafter. And I came from nothing and I've worked 24 hours a day to be able to be where I am. And I wanted someone who had that mentality too, which is this is, it's going to be done. It's already done. We're going to do it. So you have a growing team, new people, a new CEO, yeah. and you need to find a new space, yeah. which is, you know, where we're sitting today. Can you tell us a bit about the space and why yeah. you chose it? And, you know, in, specifically in terms of location and the, the kind of space yeah. that you envision? Because one of the things I've noticed about you from the very beginning is your very, your brand is very clear in your head. Yeah and everything you do is very on brand. So I imagine that was part of yeah. the decision process as well. My, my dream situation was to find a building near the old studio in, um, in East London, um, which I didn't want to move out of. And I wanted to be able to find somewhere that was self-contained. I wanted people to be able to enter through a door that was into kind of the apartment life of this brand. So we did everything that we physically could to try to find this imaginary building. And it turned up. We, we found uh, you know, a building that was built in 1902. It's, you know, it has history. Um, it, I wanted something which was on multiple levels so that we could be able to give people space and actually feel like an environment that was not too worky. Um, and I wanted it to feel that things that I was into, that I would, because I spent so much time here, I was like, well, instead of having it at my house, I would have it here. So I was like, well, if I buy a picture, I want it here. Um, if I buy something, I want to have it here, because I want people to realize that this is ultimately my life. My, my name is above the door, and, but I can't do it without you guys. So I wanted somewhere that people felt like they were in my own house. One of the other things I want to talk to you about is this uh, e-commerce site that yeah. you're launching on the 16th of June. Yeah. It's your first foray into direct retail, and yeah. you know, back to this idea of engaging directly with the consumer yeah. and not having to go through middlemen, yeah. you know, wholesalers or department stores, whomever. How have you been thinking about that website and e-commerce and what are your goals, your business goals and your creative goals? I think with it, it was to build a platform that was going to, that's why we did it at the same time, was to reflect what was happening in this building. And so I thought, right, let's move the building forward and let's coincide it with a website so that it is a platform not just for me but for everyone in the team to kind of collaborate into so it was like the building blocks of building this kind of thing and and how you could shop on it where it actually felt like you were buying from us doing a working progress right. um, which with still a polish. So we've been kind of working on it and we're now ready to launch soon. And we you know we're doing all the shooting inside. We've we built a studio inside the office so that we could shoot the product. We would shoot it on the people that we do the fittings on. It was no hair, no makeup, and just something which was very raw. And so that we could kind of talk to the consumer. We have the Instagram, the Twitter, 
the Facebook, everything, and our own kind of blog all merged into one kind of news feed because that's what we're about. You know, it's about a running dialogue with a cu customer. And I think it's a, a natural progression. It is a different product offer. It is not to cannibalize on our online network. What's, and what's different about the product offer? The product offer is more kind of, um, I think it's pieces that we believe in that maybe were not bought, bought or different colorways, or there will be more of a bag focus because it's something that we launched uh, a season, two seasons ago, which have had um, uh, a lot of traction in stores, but are not on many websites. So it was, how do we do unique colorways, more kind of like um, products that we believe in that we have maybe not sold, or things that kind of build up the global picture so that people could fundamentally buy into a look um, of, of a world that we could curate. So that we, I wanted the team to be all involved in it because I want them to learn from what is selling and what is not selling. And that things that maybe are not classics in the conventional, a shift dress and this and a pochette and da -da, that there is sometimes moments where things actually sell very well because the idea is new in that moment. Right. And I think we need statistics to work from. And I think the best thing is a website because you can gauge where it's coming from, the demographic of where right. it's coming from. And I think, I think that's really good information, especially for designers, merchandisers, um, to be able to gain from. I, I was with Michael Kors in Shanghai a few weeks ago and he was giving advice to designers and one of the things he said is, you know, one of the best things a young designer can do is stand by their merchandise in a store. And, and what you're effectively saying is your website is your kind of consumer research. Yeah. It gives you the information you need to understand what's working. Yeah, it's like a think tank. And the best thing about, well, in stores and in on an online website is people are very blunt. You, I think that is what sometimes, um, I think you grow a very thick skin now in a, in a kind of social world because everyone has an opinion and, and but it's good because it, it keeps you grounded. It keeps you kind of thinking, well, such and such in another country feels that we are not performing on the level that we should be performing then sometimes that is the honest truth. And when you hear it 30 times, then you know that we're not doing something right. We put a really good team together with it. And, um, and it's really, it's, I think people are more excited about that than the show, which I think is brilliant because, you know, the show talks to the minority. And, and that's what I think I have learned massively over the last year, which is, you know, I want my sister who lives in Northern Ireland to know what we do, but not to be reading it in magazines, just to know that it's happening and talk directly to her. Because fundamentally, that's the most important customer, nearly. It's the fashion customer is good and it's, you've got to speak to them to get it out. But I feel that the world is changing where you can talk to a bigger audience in a very simple way, because it's, it, you're cutting out the fluff. You have a lot going on here. Yeah. Um, I'm just curious, because the other big thing that's of course happened is this uh, creative directorship at Loewe. Yeah. Um, how are you balancing all of this? Because the workload, I mean, you, you hear a lot of designers talk of this, mm. um, the relentless pace of the industry, multiple collections per year, you're doing menswear and women's wear for both. Yeah. How are you managing your time? I have an amazing support system. You know, I have got a very good team here. I have a very good team at Loewe. And I have got people like Pierre-Yves and people like Delphine and other designers within the group that you can talk to to get advice. And I think it is just about a relay of information. It is about that you have to exercise your mind to be able to cope with it. So when you are doing this level of work, it is like kind of like training for a marathon. You, you cannot take the whole thing at once and sprint it. You have to kind of pace it out. And 
you know, you have to go to bed early. You have to kind of get up in the morning and eat properly. And it is about kind of a balanced life and it takes time. I'm still working that out, but you have to kind of put the goal that you're going to cut back on something because ultimately you have to keep the face and the faith to keep it going and you have to keep the end sight always there that that you're guiding all these people but i think it is about people power and you know i am uh i have worked very hard to get to this place um i don't see it as luck and i see that anyone who works for me is not about luck it's about hard work and i have teams that are working very, very, very hard, night and day, to be able to produce what you see and will see in both brands, because I believe in men's and women's, and I believe that you have to have both, because the world is about that. Well, as you continue on this marathon, yeah. we'll be watching and cheering along in the stadium at the end, and I, I want to wish you the best of luck and congratulate you because uh, you know just seeing your journey over the past five years watching from the outside yeah. really it's been quite remarkable even in the terms of the way um, you're thinking about the business yeah. and I think that's fantastic yeah. so Brilliant. best of luck to you thank you for showing us around the office and um, everyone uh, stay tuned for JW Anderson's website on June 16th Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.